I tried to, to maintain my strength as much as possible. Um, I ate all the wrong foods and so I was able to get, get some bulk up and uh, get some stored energy. Um, but she's a great cook and it's, it's hard to pass. <laughs> but emo yeah. emotionally, um, I was excited because having the, the procedure advertised as a once and done, um, at the time I was almost 11 years into this journey and to say, this is great because if we can be done with chemo for an extended period of time, it's, it's going to be such a relief because I, I had a port put in and it had failed uh, or it failed shortly afterwards, it didn't failed it? failed afterwards. Um, and so, you know, I was, it was nice to, to consider the fact that I'm not going to have to have any kind of infusions for who knows how long. Yeah. The first thing I would tell them is to get the right information. You know, the pamphlets from IMF, also find out from their provider which are, are they going to do a BECMA, are they going to do a CARVICTI. Um, find out what kind of bridging therapy that they may be put on. Let them know about some of the experiences that they'll have with either the CRS or with the neurotoxicity. Um, and make sure that they talk, if, if they're part of a support group, to talk to somebody else who's gone through CAR-T, even if it's not the same uh, treatment option that they're getting, so that they get the patient side of it. I think that's important. The patient perspective can, can really provide a lot of, of, of calming influence for somebody who's kind of on the fence about, do I really want to do this or do I not want to do this? Because we've, we've been through it and it's been successful. And uh, those 10 months of no chemo were almost like absolute heaven. <laughs> I think another important thing for any myeloma patient to understand is no matter what treatment option you're on, your journey is very unique. And you may experience something different but here's what the textbook says, and you could be at any different uh, level of experience. And to that's why I think it's important to talk to several patients, actually, who may have mm -hmm. gone through this, because your experience could be different. Uh, the length of time, just like with a stem cell, where it may continue to be effective, could be very different. And also ask your doctor, so what are my options? after CAR-T, when CAR-T um, stops working. Let's find out which one of the, of the two CAR-T programs is gonna be the best for that person, as Jill said, because we're all unique. Our, our disease is unique in each one of us. And uh, what worked for me may not work for another patient just because of, of, of our own unique physiologies or, or mental state or, or whatever the case might be. Like right now he's on his original therapy as a bridging therapy. And that's just to keep the myeloma at bay. If you get a drop, he's a kappa, if you get a drop in that free light chain, that's a bonus, which it has dropped a little bit, but he's still getting you know, blood products that are boosting his, his blood factory, which seems to be struggling. Uh, even after CAR T. Bridging is to basically keep you healthy enough so you, the myeloma hasn't taken off and so that you can have a successful CAR T experience. So you're starting at a, uh, a much better place than if your numbers were really high. So trying to keep you, you know, maintained and uh, ready to go because all of these processes take time. You have to get put on a list. Um, you have to meet certain criteria before you can get these treatments. And there has to be availability at your facility because there's a lot of yeah. hoops to jump through between your, uh, the pre-CAR T regime you have to go through and then the, the hospitalization and all those steps. And so there's a lot of conversation with your, with your um, provider and the team. We actually had a special CAR T team that was um, in contact with our oncologist down at Dana-Farber. And you've got to be ready for it, mentally. You've got to be ready for it. You've got to sign consent forms, say, yes, I, I'm willing to do this, I want to do this. And you've got to be able to have the time to, 
to, uh, to go in and do it. So if you're still working, you may have to arrange for an extended leave period with your employer. And so um, you know, things like that have to be taken into account as well. Because there's about for a month after, well, actually it starts while you're in the hospital, right after you get your uh, T cells back, you need to have 24 seven companionship. And that's in case you have any neurotoxicity. You're not allowed to drive or use any machinery for 60 months. days, for two months. So if you are actively working or you're in charge of taking care of kids, you know, depending on what your age is, you have to take all those things into account. Um, and your immune system will be affected. So you have to keep that in mind so that if you're active in, in, you know, in your church or again at your workplace or um, so some volunteer organization. I'm a retired teacher, but I still substitute. So I only substituted twice last year just because I didn't want to bring anything home. Because my immune system is pretty well compromised, but fortunately I'm getting the blood products to help keep it in a almost in, in a fairly safe level.